Erev Tov Rabotai, we are continuing with our Mishnah Yomi, Masechet Gitin. We are up to Pereke Mishnah Hei. Today's Mishnayot should be Le'ilu Nishmad, Neria Ben Svelana, Ranbaev Eliyahu Ben Burcha Yisraelov, Chana Bad Meriam, Sasson Ben Raya, and Yoshua Ben Shifra, Menuchatam Began Eden, Amen. And Le'avdil Ben Chaim Lechaim, Vede Refua Shelemav, Daniel Shalom Ben Roza, Betoch Shach Ole Yisrael. The Mishnah presents four statements made by one Tana, two of which are enactments made for the benefit of society. He'id Rabbi Yochanan ben Gudgeda. Rabbi Yochanan ben Gudgeda testified about the following four laws, meaning he testified that he received these laws from his teachers and that they are accepted as halakha. al havia. Number one, he testified concerning a deaf-mute girl whose father married her off. Echeresh, a deaf-mute, is someone who can neither hear nor speak, as it says in Terumot, chapter 1, Mishnah 2. The Torah considers a deaf mute to be not responsible for his actions, mentally incompetent. Therefore, a woman who is a deaf mute cannot get married under biblical law. Her marriage takes effect only at the rabbinic level. However, the Torah gave a father the right to marry off a minor or narak tana. As it speaks about in Mesechah Kitubo, chapter 4, Mishnah 4, and Kiddushin, chapter 2, Mishnah 1. And he can do so even if she is a deaf mute. When the Mishnah specifies that her father married her off, it means that its ruling applies even in that case where the marriage is biblical and certainly where her marriage is only rabbinic. She yotza beget, that she can be divorced by being given a get. Although a deaf mute is not considered mentally competent, her acceptance of the get is valid since a woman can be divorced without her consent. Mental competence is not required. As again, it discusses in Yavamot chapter 14, Mishnah 1, that a woman uh, can be divorced without her consent. Valaktana number two, and he testified concerning an orphaned minor, the daughter of Israel and Kohen, who after losing her father was married off by her mother or brothers to a Kohen. Like we learned earlier, only a father can marry off his daughter according to biblical law. The sages, however, decreed that her mother and brothers can marry her off, but this marriage is valid only rabbinically, and it requires her consent, as it discusses in Yavimot chapter 13, Mishnah 1 through 5. Shochelet betruma, that she may eat teruma because she is the wife of a Kohen. A Kohen's wife may eat tiruma even if her father is not a Kohen. However, since the marriage of an underage orphan girl is valid only rabbinically, her marriage to a Kohen does not permit her to eat tiruma, which is forbidden to an un-Kohen according to biblical law. The Mishnah must mean, therefore, that she may eat rabbinic tiruma, tiruma separated from produce that was subject to tithing only rabbinically. It could have been thought that the sages did not allow her to eat even rabbinic tiruma out of concern. That rabbinic tiruma out of concern that she might also eat biblical tiruma, which is forbidden to her, Rabbi Yochanan ben Gudgeda testified that rabbinic teruma is nevertheless permitted because she is still a minor who is not obligated in mitzvot. Vimeta ba'alah yorsha, and that if she dies, her husband inherits her property. When a wife dies, her property is inherited by her husband. It says in Baba Batra, chapter 8, Mishnah 1, although the, orphan's gir- the orphan girl's marriage is valid only rabbinically, the sages decreed that her, her husband inherits her. Right? Vimeta, Bala Yosha, and if she dies, her husband inherits her property. Now, although the previous law which concerned Tiruma dealt with the husband was a Kohen, this law about inheritance applies to any husband. Vala Marisha Gazul Shebenao Bibira, number 3, and he testified concerning a stolen beam that the thief built into a large building. She told the damav that the original owner takes only its value as compensation and he may not require the thief to return the beam itself. Although biblical law commands the thief to return the property he stole if it still exists, the rabbis decreed in this case that he does not have to knock down the building to return the beam itself, but may pay its monetary value instead. They enacted this law for the benefit of thieves who wish to repent and make up for what they had done, but will find it extremely difficult to return the stolen property itself. If the thief had to knock down the building, he would be reluctant to repent. The case of a stolen beam built into a building is merely an example. The same law applies wherever a thief would suffer a significant loss were he to return the item itself, as the Rambam writes in his commentary to the Mishnah. Val Khatata Gizula Shilonoda Rabim number four, and he testified concerning a stolen sin offering. An ordinary animal was stolen by someone who then sanctified it as a khatat offering. The thief was previously obligated to bring a sin offering. His obligation had nothing to do with the theft of the animal whose stolen status is unknown to the public, meaning people did not know that the animal was stolen. Shimichapere that it atones, it is treated as though it were a valid offering which provides atonement for sin. And the thief does not need to bring another animal in its place. That the offering does not actually atone for the thief because it does not belong to him. In fact, since it was not his animal to sanctify, it never became consecrated. 
This enactment was made for the benefit of the altar. Although the offering is invalid because it was stolen, the rabbis were concerned that if the thief would have to bring another in its place, the Kohanim would realize that they had sacrificed and eaten an invalid offering. This might upset them so greatly that they would refrain from bringing other offerings out of fear that they too are stolen. The rabbis therefore exempted the thief from replacing the offering for the benefit of the altar to prevent the altar from being neglected by the Kohanim and empty of offerings. However, if it was known to the public that this animal is stolen, the thief is indeed obligated to bring another offering as a sin offering. Since it is unlikely that a thief would bring an animal that is known to be stolen to the temple, the rabbis did not extend their enactment to this case in line with the general rule that the rabbis did not make decrees for unlikely cases. And that is the end of Mishnah Hay. Mishnah Vav discusses the law of the Sikrikon, which is another enactment made regarding stolen property. A Sikrikon is a murderous non-Jew who steals land from a Jew by threatening to kill him. The word Sikrikon is derived from the words Sakalka Vanicheni, take the land and leave me. As the Rav explains in Bikurim chapter 1, Mishnah 2. The law of the Sikrikon relates to a Jew who bought land from a Sikrikon who had stolen it from another Jew. Before explaining the law itself, the Mishnah defines the circumstances in which it applies. Loya Sikrikon Biudad. The law of Sikrikon did not apply in the land of Yehuda, the southern part of Eretz Israel, Barugem and Chama, when Jews were being killed as a result of the war. The Mishnah refers to the war waged by the Roman general Titus on Judah and Jerusalem during which the Second Temple was destroyed. Meaning, if someone bought land from a Sikrikon during the war, he was not subject to the law of Sikrikon explained below in the Mishnah. Rather, he was allowed to keep the land without any restrictions. Because the occupying Roman government allowed and even encouraged the murder of Jews during the war, a Jewish owner would wholeheartedly give up his land to a Sikrikon who seized it from him. A Sikrikon legally therefore owned the land and its sale to another Jew was valid. Even though the Sikrikon did not pay for the land but forced the Jew to give it to him, the Jew was so afraid for his life that he gave it to him wholeheartedly. Since the transaction was carried out with full intent, it was valid and the land became the legally owned property of the Sikrikon. This law applied in the land only in the land of Judah because the Romans targeted the land of Judah in particular with their brutal decrees as they had a tradition that Judah, Yehuda, son of Yaakov, killed their forefather Esav. Even though it's a discussion who actually killed Esav, that was their tradition. However, after the period in which Jews were killed as a result of the war, meaning after the war, when the Romans' hostility subsided and they forbade the murder of Jews, the law of Sikrikon applied even the land of Yehuda. Therefore, the law of Sikrikon applies in all parts of Israel and at all times, except in Yehuda during the war. Since the Jews were no longer subjected to the earlier murderous decrees, a landowner would not be as frightened and would not surrender ownership of his land to a Sikrikon who seizes it. Although the land o- landowner gave up his land, he did not surrender his ownership of it. Rather, he thought to himself, I will let the Sikrikon take it now, and later I will sue him in court to get it back. The Sikrikon therefore did not own the land, and his later sale was not valid. Someone who bought the stolen land from the Sikrikon was therefore subject to the law of the Sikrikon. The Mishnah now defines the law of the Sikrikon. Ketzad, how so? What is the law of the Sikrikon? If a Jew bought land from a Sikrikon, which the Sikrikon had stolen from another Jew, and then in order to make his possession of the land legal, the buyer went and also bought it from the original owner, meaning after paying the Sikrikon for the land, the buyer performed an act of Kinyan acquisition to acquire it from the original owner. However, he did not pay the original owner. Mikachob Batel, his purchase is void, and he must return the land to its owner because the owner never really meant to sell it to him. The sale made by the Sikrikon is certainly void since he never owned the field, and even the sale made by the original owner is void because according to the law of Sikrikon, we assume that he did not really want to sell it, rather he only pretended to sell it because he was afraid that the Sikrikon who had already sold it to the third person might kill him otherwise. A Sikrikon would be angry if the owner did not, does not agree to sell the land to the buyer because that would appear as if the owner is planning to take his land back. And the Mishnah speaks of a case where the buyer did not actually pay the original owner for the field, but just made an act of acquisition, Kinyan, for it. If he did pay, it is his to keep because the owner's agreement to the sale was presumably sincere. Mibala Bayit, however, if he bought the stolen land from the owner first, the Chazav Lakach Misikrikon, and then he went and bought it from the Sikrikon, meaning after Sikrikon stole the land, a second Jew bought it from the owner with the Kinyan, and then he bought it from the Sikrikon. Mikacho Kayam, his purchase is valid, and he does not need to return it to the original owner, because in such a case, the owner did mean to sell it to him. Before the Sikrikon sold the land, the original owner was not under pressure to sell it to anyone, so if the owner did sell it at that time, he presumably did so with full intent, and the sale is valid. The Mishnah interrupts the subject of Sikrikon and discusses a similar law, 
This law concerns land owned by a husband that he designated to be used as payment for his wife's ketubah. If the husband dies before his wife or divorces her, she is entitled to collect a certain amount, the ketubah payment from his estate. If he's designated a specific piece of land to be used as the payment, he may not sell without her permission. And if he did sell without asking her, she may seize it from the person who bought it. He cannot sell the land again unless his wife gives him permission. If someone bought land from the husband who had designated as payment for his wife's ketubah, the chazav lakach min aisha, and then in order to make his possession of the land legal, he went and also bought the rights of the land from the wife. Mikachob batel, his purchase is void, and he may not keep the land because the wife did not really mean to sell her rights to, to him. Now the original purchase from the husband and the later purchase from the wife are both void. The husband cannot sell the field without his wife's agreement because he designated her for it for to buy payment, and the buyer's purchase of the wife's agreement is also invalid because she can claim that she did not really sell her rights. Rather, in order to please her husband, who clearly wanted to sell the land, she pretended to sell her rights. Since her sale was not sincere, it does not take effect. Mina Isha, however, if he bought the rights to sell the land from the wife first, the chazav lakach mina ish. And then he went and bought the land from the husband. Mikachol Kayam, his purchase is valid and he may keep the land because in such a case the wife did mean to sell it. Since the wife agreed to sell her rights to the land before her husband sold it, she cannot claim that she just pretended to do so in order to please her husband. Therefore, the purchase of her rights is valid and the buyer may keep the field. The Mishnah returns to the laws of the Sikrikon. Zo Mishnah Rishona, this law that one who bought stolen land from a Sigrikon and then bought it from the owner must return it to the owner is the original teaching that the sages applied. But a court that came after them changed the ruling and said, Someone who buys stolen land from a Sigrikon and then buys it from the owner may give back only one quarter to the owner and keep the rest for himself. The court made this change in order to encourage people to buy land from Sigrikin and restore Eretz Yisrael to Jewish ownership. Originally, the Jews were reluctant to buy stolen land from a Sikrikon because even if they then went and bought it from the owner with the Kinyan, they would then have to return it to the owner and lose both the field and the money that they spent on it. There was therefore a concern that Sikrikin would take permanent hold of land in Eretz Yisrael. The rabbis therefore decreed that one who buys land from a Sikrikon legally owns it, but he must give one quarter of it or pay one quarter of its value to the original owner. The reason the rabbis specified one quarter is that a Sikrikon who paid nothing for the land he stole would sell it for only three quarters of its true value. The buyer therefore profited by an extra quarter from the deal. It is this quarter that he must return to the original owner. Since according to this later enactment, the real owner gets back only one quarter of the land that another Jew buys from a Sikrikon, the rabbis did not always allow another Jew to buy stolen land from a Sikrikon. Ematai, when does this ruling apply that one may buy stolen land from a Sikrikon, in which case the real owner receives only one quarter? Bisman Shem Biyadan Nikach. When the owner does not have enough money to buy the land from a Sikrikon. But when the owner does have enough money to buy the land back in, could mean the he comes before any other person, meaning he has the right to buy the land from the Sikrikon before anyone, everyone else, and no one else is allowed to buy it. And if someone else did buy it before him, the owner can force the buyer to sell it to him for the price that he paid the Sikrikon. If, however, the owner did not have enough money to buy back his field from the Sikrikon and someone else went ahead and bought it instead of him, the owner cannot force the buyer to sell him the land even after he does have enough money to buy it. In such a case, the buyer keeps the field and gives the owner just one quarter of it. Now, this law that an owner who has enough money has the right to buy his land back before anyone else originally applied, regardless of how long the land was in the possession of the Sikrikon. Later, however, the rabbis changed the law and limited the rights of the owner. Rabbi Yoshid Beddin Rabbi Rabbi Yudha Nasi assembled the court to review the laws of the Sikrikon. Then he knew Shema Shata Bifne Sikrikon Shnei Masachodesh and they voted that if the stolen land had remained with the Sikrikon for 12 months or more, during which the original owner failed to buy it back, Kol HaKodem Nikach Zocheh, whoever is first to buy it from the Sikrikon acquires it permanently. After 12 months have passed, the owner loses his right to buy the field from the Sikrikon before anyone else, even if he has enough money to buy it himself. Rebbe's court saw that even after the Romans prohibited the killing of Jews, some had such great fear of Sikrikin that they would wholeheartedly give up ownership of the land to a Sikrikon. This is what the people of Judah did during the war, like we said earlier. The court decided that if someone who gave his land to a Sikrikon failed to buy it back within a year, he is presumably one of those people who are terribly afraid of Sikrikin, as Rashi says on page 58b in Mesechet Gitin. Therefore, the Sikrikon is the legal owner of the field. Anyone is therefore allowed at that point to buy the field for the Sikrikon, from the Sikrikon and keep it for himself. Nevertheless, even in such a case, if someone else buys it, he must give one quarter of the land back to the owner. Although the buyer is not the legal owner of the land, he must give one quarter of it to the original owner for the reason that we said earlier. And that is not about to have today's Mishnah Yomi. Amen